upholding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. We signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Welcome, my friends from around the world. Patrick Wood here for Technocracy News and Trends. We have a special treat for you today, as I am in the presence of two founders, two leaders, and founders of the movement that, uh, that we are so concerned with today, called Sustainable Development, Agenda 21, Technocracy, Agenda 2030, all the things that surround it, Habitat 3, all of those programs that are coming from the United Nations to swamp and oppress nations around the world. It's gone across America like a wildfire, as you know. Every city, every county, every little burg in our country has been infiltrated to some extent with this ideology and these programs and policies that did not originate in America. Well, the question starts out, where did all this start? Where did the resistance start against these things? There's lots of people talking about this today, other than technocracy news and trends. How did this start? Where did this start from? Well, Today, I'm going to have an interview for you with two of the original leaders of this movement, Mr. Michael Shaw and his wife, Joanne. They were the founders of Freedom Advocates, which is freedomadvocates.org on the Internet. And they have been, for such a long time, part of the original cadre of people who exposed Agenda 21 in our nation. So I thought it would be interesting if we took a look back in history, not so much to understand the, the details and the workings of sustainable development and those sorts of things, but it would be interesting to take a look back at the history of our movement, because here we have two people that were there at the beginning. They knew all the people that were involved back in that day. And it's not like it was 50 years ago either, by the way. This is a relatively modern thing that we're fighting. Um, started, as you know, in the early 1990s. So... The movement is not that old, but the fact that we have fathers in, <laughs> of the movement is important to understand for those of us who are fighting the movement today. So welcome, Michael Shaw and Joanne. Well, it's nice to be here, Pat. Yes, thanks for having us. It's good to tell you're going to You're going to spill the beans for us on what it was like way back when. You, it, once upon a time, there was a day when you were an absolute... Loader. You were the only one, perhaps, that kind of saw something going on. And I know you remember some of those early people, some of the things that happened along the way, the conferences that were held in different places around the country, some of the players that were involved. Tell us kind of how you got started. What, what sparked your interest in any of this stuff? We had the fortune, I could say misfortune more appropriately, of living in a place called Santa Cruz, California. Now, Santa Cruz was one of the original plotting grounds for the Agenda 21 movement. There were five or six cities across the country that uh, played that role. And uh, we were landowners in Santa Cruz and residents there and uh, attempt were, had been attempting for a long time to uh, develop our property with at least our own house and had tremendous difficulties in doing that. And the land use policies in Santa Cruz were horrible. And so we spent the 1990s trying to understand the political dynamics that would cause a place like Santa Cruz to be so crazy and so um, resistant to American norms and legal norms. And uh, so the first big step that we took in that process in terms of getting to some real answers was Joanne's discovery of a group called Freedom 21, which was headed up by past since then, named Henry Lamb, and uh, maybe Joanne can talk a little bit about um, what that f first um, engagement with Henry and uh, a few of the fellows that he had engaged already fighting this 
program called Agenda 21, otherwise now known as Sustainable Development. And if you haven't heard that term, you, you're, you're, you're not awake because uh, sustainable development dominates the political landscape of America and certainly of California. I mean, California has dived headlong into this program and um, the, the policies and the political dynamics of California have changed very abruptly in the last 10 years. So, Joanne, as you were looking, doing a little bit of research on this, you obviously didn't find a lot of material out there. I would be my guess. There wasn't a lot of published material back in that day. And you ran across the Freedom 21 organization, right? Tell us a little bit about well, that. a friend of ours, there was a community meeting, a community plan coming into our little town. And... Fortunately, there were people in our area who had been to the UN conferences, who had been reading Henry Lamb way before we even understood sustainable development. And I thank them. I'm, I feel blessed to have known them because they were very helpful. And one of them passed on a Henry Lamb article called The Consensus Process. And this community meeting was going to use the consensus process. And Henry Lamb back in the 90s, wrote basically everything that anyone could pick up and go and understand what was really happening in their communities. We studied the consensus process, the dialectic, cognitive dissonance. Then we went to the, the town meeting where they were going to expand the boundaries of the town. Certain people were going to vote on what could happen with other people's property. Um, but fortunately, we met quickly these people who were very well educated and researched in what was going on, taught us, and we um, went together and turned this meeting around completely. And we thought, okay, we have the information, we need to get more information out to people and let others know that they're being deceived. People don't really think they're being lied to when they hear the warm and fuzzy terms, but they are being lied to. And that's, and that's what we try to educate people about, that what's in front of their eyes is not really happening. So initially, you could have just consumed the information and used it for your own purposes uh, and your own property rights issues. Yes. But you took another turn, and I'm sure you did that. You, you used the information you got for your own use uh, to solve your own personal problems. But... You took, you took it a step beyond that. You said, not only is it just for us, this is like something that needs that everybody needs to know about. Absolutely. We knew the bottom line is population reduction. That's very hard to come to, but that's the bottom line. And the erosion of the Constitution in the United States. My parents left South Africa with the dream of the United States, and to watch it deteriorate, there's no choice but to try to save it. And there were so many people in worse situations than Michael and me that we wanted. People were deprived of housing. We at least had a home and then this extra land. But we saw people losing their homes with the policies that were going on. Very sad stories. Thousands of sad stories. Um, and, ha and we wanted to save the country. And it was happening right under your nose. Yes, at the local level. That's at, where people, at the local level. At right. the local level. And we know now that uh, looking backwards, it just happens to be that Santa Cruz uh, was the pilot project for Agenda 21 in America. One it, of it, the places. There were a few others. Austin. Um, today, every city, doesn't matter how large or how small it is, is engaged in Agenda 21. And the real development program is to create 12 urbanized centers across America that will house the entire American population, which is intended to be reduced dramatically. But uh, they don't want people in the countryside. They want people under total watch, surveillance, and control. And um, so that's why we've seen sort of a lessening of the exodus to rural areas across the country, because the policy has made it much more difficult to... to um, move to rural America, um, and um, in the policies inside cities, I mean, in California now, there are organizations, so-called COGS, councils of government, as well as state legislation now that requires all new construction to be multifamily and to be near transit centers so that cars can be eliminated and people drive public transportation rather than an automobile 
and live in stack and pack apartment housing. And if you live in an urban area, I don't care where you are. You could be in San Jose or San Francisco, or you can be in Des Moines, Iowa, and you're finding these same kinds of multifamily dense developments where all people are expected to be stacked and packed so they could be easily controlled, monitored, and their life really is in the hands of the political um, dynamics that control their community. So you you folks started um, your your initial level of activism where where you said we, we have to have some kind of publicity, we have to be able to get this this information out to people. And I, I remember you've had more than one website over the years, but your primary work developed into a website called Freedom Advocates, which is, has a .org extension on the end of it. It was first Freedom 21 Santa Cruz. And then when we broadened out of Santa Cruz, we changed to Freedom Advocates. Okay. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the, the genesis of your idea for publishing information. Yeah, I know you had other people involved at some point where they were writing some articles for you. You wrote some articles. Mm-hmm. You also did some speaking along the way in different places. And uh, tell us a little bit about the early days, how you kind of organized some of this stuff. Well, we had these spectacular researchers who helped us. So we really knew what the bottom line was and um, exposed us to Bev Ackman and Michael Kaufman. And going to that first Freedom 21 conference was a grassroots activist type of meeting. So we met people from all over the country. People came from even outside the country because it's going on all over the world. And we said, who's doing this? Is it, no one, it was up to us to make something happen at the grassroots level. And Michael and I wanted to not talk to the choir. We really made an effort to keep our tone in a manner that wouldn't repel people or wouldn't trigger um, reactions from people. So we were very patient in the delivery of our information and very patient in the wait for people to truly understand. But eventually, if there's an opening, people get it. And once they understand what's really happening, there's no going back. And then you have more people working at the grassroots, filming meetings, uh, writing letters to the editor, talking at city council meetings, knowing their rights, knowing their private property rights. And it's, it's knowing right from wrong and standing up for what is right and getting more people to do that. Who were some of the, you mentioned a couple of names along the way of people that were involved in the early days. Um, and I know many of them became friends, uh, mm-hmm. personal friends over the years. Tell us a little bit about some of those people, who they were and, and why they, what was their injection into this whole thing? You remember some, some of those some folks? Some of them like to be private still to this day because yeah. they've got such deep research. So I, I hope those people know who they are. I think they do. But some of the more public names would be um, Madeline Cosman, who was writing about Agenda 21 in the medical field. Um, outstanding work. Um, Dr. Madeline. Michael Kaufman, Henry Lamb, of course. He was the granddaddy getting the information out. And he still, to this day, I would encourage anybody to read his material because it's so um, revealing at the local level what is going on in every town. It's interesting. The people come from all different kinds of backgrounds and, and experiences. Henry was a contractor, and he began to, in mid-90s, um, experience bizarre behavior by um, city bureaucracies. And uh, he was able to pretty quickly trace that back to um, programs being adopted by eastern cities. He, he was an easterner. And uh, eastern cities that uh, were early in adopting the Agenda 21 protocol. And uh, these restrictions um, were massive and controlling and made it very difficult uh, to do the business he was doing. And so he moved out of contracting into the form- and into the formation of, a, of a Freedom 21 to take on the issues that um, arose as a result of sustainable development or Agenda 21 implementation. And, um, you know, he, he got it started. People like Dr. Michael Kaufman from Maine um, who was a, a writer and um, a researcher, had been a forester um, for a number of decades up in the Northeast, uh, was one of the early um, supporters of Henry and uh, 
they they moved very effectively in about 1999 in the formation of Freedom 21, and uh, Joanne came across them in the year 2000, and and we just packed right up and tried to do our part with an increasing number of people from around the country. There were not very many Californians, in fact. But there were so many people contributed. Bev Ekman on how to counter group manipulation. Charlotte Iserbeet on what was going on in the schools. The list goes on. There's so many people. They don't get mainstream publicity, but they're very strong um, leaders. Of course, many of these people are still uh, with us today. Some, some have passed on, like Henry Lamb and, and uh, Dr. Kaufman have passed. Uh, so a lot of these people are still around. But it seems to me like for, for all the diversity that existed, uh, contractor, uh, uh, property rights issue, uh, an educator like Charlotte Isserby, they got you know, other types of you know, people coming from different walks of life. Mm-hmm. And yet they all found a, a common thread, a common purpose to be involved, exactly. right? Right. And so as they combined to share knowledge, something bigger than the parts came out of it. Right. And Dr. Stan Monteith, also out of Santa Cruz, was very effective uh, in bringing all those people and showing how they all fit together because he would be on the air five hours a day. And I learned so much from his radio shows and, and, and like you say, bringing those different. Right. Stan, Dr. Stan Monteith, by the way, was was legendary in his effort to promote truth, if you will, in all kinds of areas. But this is one area that was uh, that he was so so effective. He was on many radio stations around the country. Uh, my guess is a lot of our listeners know exactly who Dr. Stan Monteith is. He was right from your local area. Absolutely. He lived right down this, almost right down the street, or right up the hill, or whatever from from you guys, which mm-hmm. was a uh, a stroke of great fortune to have him right there in the, in the neighborhood. That's right. And uh, he also had a wealth of research and material. Oh, my gosh. And I had been, been to his library and looked through it a little bit. I never have seen such a personal library in my life. And so the research in those days, all I'm getting to is it was very deep. It wasn't shallow. Absolutely. It was deep. And when, when I first saw Stan's library, and he didn't invite people to just come up and, oh, hey, come up and see my library. He never did that. But he allowed me to come up one time to go into his studio and to, to go through his library, and I was just flabbergasted when I saw some 20-plus thousand volumes of books from all over the world, from the United Nations to uh, antique books uh, from the League of Nations, and uh, you name it. He had, it's a history archive of nothing like it I've ever seen. And I ask him, being probably naive at that point, I ask him, so how many of these books have you read? (laughs) (laughs) And he he turned around to me and almost snapped at me, and he got this dead serious look. He looked square in the eye, and he said very sternly, all of them. And I believed it. I had no (laughs) doubt at that point. I had no doubt that he had read every book that he brought in. And this is over a period of probably 25 years that he had collected this library. And he was an absolute brain, uh, an encyclopedic, all by himself. He could pull stuff out of, out of the air that I just, just absolutely incredible. So he was a guy that was right up the street and did contribute along the way, a lot of material and a lot of information and stuff, and publicity as well to get it out. Because I know you were on his radio program many times. Well, I um, actually... On Wednesdays for a couple of years, I it was the Freedom 21 Santa Cruz radio show. So he was uh, very, um, for us, in getting our message out, which was really an adjunct to his overall message because it largely focused on Agenda 21 as well. Because Agenda 21, many Americans don't understand this. Many Americans aren't aware at all. But Agenda 21 is the political force that has been driving this country since George Bush Sr., who, who signed off on the Agenda 21 Protocol in 1992 at the United Nations, he went down to Rio de Janeiro to do that. You know, unfortunately, Donald Trump is one who supports it as well. So we've had six straight presidents who have been Agenda 21 proponents. 
and they keep it very quiet. Even Fox News doesn't talk about it. They did do a show on it in about the year 2001, but have been silent since then. So it's, it's really been up to the citizenry to get this word around. The major newspapers, which most of us know now are controlled by a few, few outlets, uh, do not make mention of Agenda 21 and um, do not expose the public to what its real in-game is all about. So it's been up to citizens, the late 90s and early 2000s, people like us, but now the numbers are much greater, and uh, hopefully five years from now, have a president in D.C. who understands these issues, will take us down a new path, expose the rest of the country to the, the evil path that we're on. I mean, all the dislocation we're experiencing now all the frustration that the average American feels is a direct result of, of Agenda 21 implementation. And so many of the people who support sustainable development have no idea its origins, its background, its purpose. They need to open their eyes, need to see this, so that we can come together as Americans, believing in the rights of each individual and not the right of the collective to take control of your person and your property so that we can return to the course that America was destined for. Um, otherwise, we're going to lose America to, to, to the human, human race, and that would be a, one of the greatest loss in, in human history. You mentioned George Bush <clears throat> Sr., who was the sitting president when Agenda 21 was originally coined or produced, adopted in Rio de Janeiro in 1972. 92, rather. And he's, he passed off the first signature, which was primarily a ceremonial signature for him at that point. But he signed off for at least a photo op. And then he immediately passed it off to the incoming president, which was William Jefferson Clinton, a Democrat, who supposedly had great rivalry with the Bush family back then. And they were great enemies, they said. And Americans were all steamed up about oh, the Reagan era is going away and liberal Democrat like Bill Clinton is coming in with Al Gore and there's lots of uh, political bantering between Democrats and public Republicans back then. But we, we have seen, as you just mentioned, that this does not seem to be a political issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's like there's complicity everywhere you look. So it was just as easy for a Bill Clinton to implement Agenda 21 policies or, or foster them in our country, as it was for George H.W. Bush, who came in and simply picked up the, the same you know, relay baton and kept running the same race. But meanwhile, Americans have been fighting over Republican versus Democrat issues, and it's worse today probably than ever before. When uh, President Clinton injected sustainable development into every federal department in our country. That was when the trouble really started, and that's what future presidents need to work on clearing out, because that's where these policies are still dribbling into our communities. They're not called Agenda 21 anymore. They have all different names, but they fit the program. And that was Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development that we're still... Yeah, because uh, George Bush Jr. followed these programs. Barack Obama did as well. And uh, Trump has never disavowed them. He has an um, infrastructure program as a complete adoption of these, these programs as it would affect uh, infrastructure. And, and, and people need to understand infrastructure is not roads and bridges necessarily. It's a smart city s system set up which is now beginning to happen everywhere under the Agenda 21 program. And that's so that you can be monitored and controlled through the electronic uh, process that we have today that ties, so in, ties in so well to technocracy, as you've explained so, so nicely. Technocratic advances give rise to a centralization of government power, advantage to these councils of government, which are all across the country. In San Francisco, they're taking complete control from the San Francisco Bay Area of 101 cities. Um, and now we'll have a, um, a technocratic, unelected bureaucracy to make all land use decisions for all 101 cities. This is globalism at its ultimate. This is what Americans need to become aware of. It's not against Democrats. It's 
not against Republicans. It's both Democrats and Republican leadership that is fully committed to this path and has been for decades now. Right. For all of the denials that politicians have uttered to people like us that, oh, you're one of those conspiracy people. Well, Agenda 21, they say, is a, is a conspiracy. There's nothing there. It's just somebody just dreamed up that we're doing this in secret and that, uh, uh, you know, it's going to destroy the country. But there's no conspiracy. There's no uh, there's nothing to be worried about. And, and even if there was, um, other countries are dealing with it. It's all voluntary. Nobody's forcing anybody to do anything. And yet they have succeeded in slipping in under the radar to implement all these policies, first from the top down, from the federal government down, but also from the bottom up by other outside organizations, for instance, like the ICLE organization. And I know ICLE is one of your hot buttons. You've dealt with them with that a lot over time. ICLE is an NGO that is not from America. They're outside of the American shores, and yet this organization, an accredited NGO with the United Nations, came into America to affect hundreds and hundreds of cities with Agenda 21 policies and documents. Well, that's exactly right. ICLE stands for the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Well, that fits perfectly. So you combine that with a federal, I keep coming back to these COG organizations, you'll find ICLE sits on the board of most COG organizations. The COG's objective is to change how it is that your community operates. No more single-family homes. That you can see that example in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, no more single-family homes are allowed. Everything's stack and pack. Um, all this is part of the globalist movement, and ICLE is a very key organization. I have to say, not, not to be proud of it at all, but, but um, ICLE uh, had their comeuppance in America at one point where uh, they, were, they felt like they were forced to change their name. They kept the term ICLE, but they changed the official name of the organization. And they took down the list of cities that were officially ICLE cities that had signed up to be members of this organization. Yes, most cities, you know, it's a very, very effective organization. And they started to feel the heat that I think we were putting on, on them and the exposure they were receiving. So they changed their name and tried to hide under and crawled under the cracks here at the COG organization so they could continue with their... Their program, they worked very hard to get themselves out of public. I was concerned about ICLE because um, representatives from other other countries were coming in and working in our planning departments, the most intimate areas of our communities, understanding the infrastructure, everything. And I thought, this is like high crimes and misdemeanors and treason. This is this is not safe for us. So our security was at risk when all of these people. We're coming in, working in our in our governments, and and likewise, we were being sent to other countries. There were at one time as many as six hundred and I think twenty or so cities in America that were officially members of the ICLE organization. I know that I believe that's dropped a little bit, but it's hard now to find the master list of all the cities that are involved. So, uh, one advice to any listener of this who's curious to know whether your city has any association with ICLE whatsoever is to simply go down and ask them. And it's called the, Local Governments for Sustainability. Governments, local Governments for Sustainability. I think that's what it is. But you, it's still ICLE.org, I believe. And you just go down and ask your city council or, or your city clerk or whatever. Say, what does the city have to do with uh, this organization, ICLE? Likely they'll just tell you because they're not alarmed that they're members. <laughs> they think, well, it's great. This member, you know, they give us a lot of good information. Well, sure, I'll tell you, yeah, we're a member, or no, we're not a member. Well, you know, it's the whole idea of sustainable development, the moniker for Agenda 21. Most people think, well, who wouldn't be for sustainable development? What alternative could be better? That, that, that's where, when you have that attitude, for your friends who do have that attitude, that's exceedingly naive, and that's what's going to cause the ruination of America. So you just have to know that sustainable development is a moniker for something far more anti-human. Anti-human. And that is Agenda 21. And, and uh, that's not a conspiracy. There's a... 
It nice is a conspiracy. Thing. They've been they've been conspiring, That's but it's true. out in the open. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's conspiracy they are the ones they are the ones conspiring, theory. not us. Exactly. They have conspired. Exactly. So conspiracy is part of it, but. Uh, now, I remember uh, looking at a video of Nancy Pelosi, for instance, introducing Agenda 21 into the oh, into yeah. the House yeah. way back yeah. when in the day. Yeah. Uh, her and other uh, some Republicans as well yeah, were absolutely. all proud of their achievement, yeah. that they're going to be the big leader. And then I remember um, a speech by a gentleman, his name slips me right now, but he got the idea that, that they needed to change the name of Agenda 21 in America because it was alarming too many people and too much resistance was popping up. So they suggested the better name for Agenda 21 would henceforth be called Smart Growth. Part of, part of it is Smart Growth. Yeah. There's also the Wildlands Project. So many names. Yeah. Yes. And they just keep changing. But they're all elements of the Sustainable Development Program, which is a synonym for Agenda 21, which is world government. A world government where no one has the rights to be themselves, to be expressive. Simply all people are to be cogs in a world order controlled by central masters. And I don't know anybody who wants that kind of world, but people are not understanding. They're not understanding what we will lose, which is our, our, our rights to life, liberty, and the mm -hmm. pursuit of happiness, our structure of government where we're innocent before proven guilty. All of those things will be turned upside down. It took 600 years, um, historians say, to incubate and hatch the American experience originally. In other words, 600 years of history prior to the establishment of America through a number of circumstances, a number of edicts, a number of government changes and things in Europe mostly. But up to that point, there had never been anything in America before like that. But those 600 years, had they not happened, America would not have happened. But the, the implication of that is if we lose such an experiment that took so much history and effort to arrive at in the first place, that it will take at least, if it was ever to come back after that, it will take at least 600 years, if ever, to redevelop the moral, the philosophical base that would give us another America in the world. Right. So what's at risk? What you're saying, what's at risk now? If we lose it now, we're in big trouble. Absolutely. It, we won't see it back. We won't get it back in our lifetimes. Well, Nor our children. It's going to take, I've heard thousands of years to recover, but it might be 600. And any, the thing about this movement is anybody can participate. One person, a group of people, everybody has the power to do something to open other people's eyes as to what's going on, because this is the time where we have to do it. <clears throat> I see a people coming from so many different areas of stimulus that get them fired up. You originally got fired up over property rights issues. That was, uh, that was your business, and you discovered something was haywire, and you pursued it, and you arrived at Agenda 21. Well, there's other people who who got upset over education, the, the, the education their children are receiving in school or in college. So they start doing research. Guess what? They end up at the same place, Agenda 21. Somebody else gets upset about smart grid and the implementation of smart these smart meters and stuff to collect data from people's homes on the energy usage and stuff like that. And they get worked up and they start doing some research. Who's doing this? They end up at Agenda 21. Somebody else comes along, they're upset about the medical implications of 5G, the new uh, you know, microwave transmission scheme that's being implemented throughout the world and pushed radically here in America. And they're very concerned about 5G and what it's going to do to the, to the health of those who live close to the little uh, transmitters and stuff. And they start doing some research. Guess where they end up? Agenda 21. And you could go on and on and on with other examples of how, and what, what this shows is how many tentacles there are that have been spread out into our society. And each one of these tentacles, if somebody out there in, in the, the country and some little isolated place starts picking up on something that they are concerned about, just doesn't seem right, likely they're going to end up back at Agenda 21. Okay. So you end up with people like us coming together 
from all these different angles we came from, we, we end up saying, you know, wow, look around at all the people here. Look at around at where they came from, what they're concerned about. And it's all about Agenda 21. That's where it started. That was the watershed that started all of these different programs. Question, how important is it ultimately for Americans to see the big picture of the, not just the little microcosm of it, not, as good people would fight 5G without knowing anything else. I'm okay with that. But how important is it for Americans, if we're really going to solve this problem once and for all, ultimately, to understand the big picture, that it's not just this or this or this or this, but it's been a full court press ever since 1992 to completely change the fabric of American society. It's critical that people understand what we're fighting. We can't beat it unless we understand it to the core. Because when winning one battle, there are hundreds more to go pursue. And um, if, if people don't truly understand what they're fighting, we can never win. So I say, get your issue covered and learn more. Keep going. Peel the onion. It's never ending. It gets worse and worse. But there is hope because more and more people are understanding it, and we have succeeded in, in turning things around in many places. Expose, people's, expose the people who are implementing Agenda 21 or whatever program under a different name. Film them while they're doing their damage. These people don't like to be in the light of day being exposed for what they're actually doing. And sometimes they don't even understand what they're doing. They're just being a useful idiot. So there's all sorts of ways that we can conquer it. So are you suggesting that, uh, that, that, there ought to be, that, that we ought to go and petition Congress and that there ought to be a law against this sort of thing? Or, or is this something that, that we just need to take up with our own local communities? Well, I think you have to take it up with your local communities because the people in Congress are bought and paid for for this globalist agenda. And um, both po political parties are fully supportive. Um, so you're not going to make progress in Washington, D.C. It feels like we made progress with Trump because he's not Hillary, but Trump is one of them as well. So you want to make progress. You've got to do it in your community because it's your community who is following these instructions. It's your community who's taking this money to implement these programs. It's your community that needs to become awakened to the realities of Agenda 21. It is your neighbors that need to read the Agenda 21 protocol. One of the documents that comprises Agenda 21 um, is the Biodiversity Assessment Report. It's 1,100 pages long, and it calls for, the, for an 85% reduction in human population. That's what our government is supporting. This can't stand. But the only way to fight it is down at your city council, down at your county supervisor's meeting, and at the local level. Because it's got to be your neighbors. It's got to be the typical American who has to stand up like an American and say, no. And no fear. Do not be afraid. All sorts of intimidating tactics will come at you. You won't get permits. The whisper campaigns will start. Everything. Just know that's being effective. That's a good thing. And don't let what other people say about you affect you. Stand up for what's right. That's the only way we I think the American people, like many Europeans today, we should talk about Europe just for a second. I think there's a real backlash taking place in Europe for all the free, the oppression of freedom and personal rights that Europe has undergone for the last, oh, at least 40 years uh, when the, the beginnings of the EU started and brought them to the place today where they have no latitude whatsoever in most nations to do anything. They can't move left, right, up, down, sideways. And people are fed up with it over there. It's been a quiet campaign for a long time, but now they're getting more vocal. They're standing up. They're, they're confronting their leaders. Uh, sometimes they're working within it, but they're electing people now there that are, uh, that are anti globalist. And they call that mostly the populist movement, but they're anti globalist. They're standing up against what the EU has done and don't know where this is going to end. But when people get fed up enough, they stand up and start doing something. Europe got trapped by local action. They went to every town, every county, every province, every region, whatever, and every country to subvert the will of those people to the EU, to the Euro European Union, until they got control on a regional basis. They, 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 they created the perfect 
regionalism government there where the people had no say. And they finally said, we've had enough of this. We're, we're, we're going to stand up against this. So there's all kinds of expressions of resistance in, in, in Great Britain right now with the rise of Nigel Farage and the Brexit Party, the, the reemergence of the Brexit Party. You have um, uh, different elections going on that just got concluded in Europe where, uh, where long-term leftists are being thrown out on their ear. And in place, you have people coming in that are talking about, we need to get rid of this globalist agenda for our country, for our you know, region or whatever. And sooner or later, there's an opportunity for America to join, I think, that revolution where there will be some critical mass someday that people are going to look at each other and say, we can't take it anymore. And we're just going to stand up in mass and we're going to do something, you know, we're going to start making ourselves known. But does, but this starts with one person, right? I mean, there's like people like you took a stand when nobody was taking a stand and everybody thought you were probably crazy. Right. And there were a few other people taking a stand. Mm -hmm. There were. Um, And yes, you called crazy, but that's a compliment. You know, (laughs) we're doing the right thing and we're, we're having an effect. And um, there are more people than we think that, actually do understand they just need to be brought out of the woodwork and and get motivated to do what they're able to do i still believe that many americans have a sense of fair play a sense of some sense of values uh, some sense of, of personal freedom even if they don't look like it sometimes and they say dumb things i think deep down most americans still have values of america in their heart but they just haven't quite figured out that that's more important than what they see on the surface of it. It's like somebody that's staring at their iPhone all the time, walking down the street, bumping into light poles. <laughs> right. You know, they get mesmerized by that. But when they finally look up with it, they say, what am I doing here? What, why, why is my face all bruised for going into light poles? I gotta stop this, I gotta do something about it. And they eventually do. Right, and, and it's recognizing what they have to lose. Mm-hmm. You think there's any hope for America? I do, I do, I absolutely think there's hope. I see new people, waking up. I see more writings. We have to have hope. I see many more people out there with the understanding that we had just 20 years ago. Yeah, it's, um, you have to be hopeful. You have reason to be hopeful, but it still requires individuals, one by one, to make the conscious decision. They want to be Americans. They want their children to enjoy the independence, the individualism, that comes with being American, and um, the, the realization that that can be preserved or uh, by working at the local level to reverse these Agenda 21 sustainable development policies in your town and county. Because once your town and county does it, and uh, so it's, it's a matter of staying hopeful, watching the, the troops grow, watching them become more effective, and taking back the country. I mean, we had a long way to go 20 years ago. We've still got a fair distance to go. We're not ahead of the curve for certain, but we've made progress, and uh, we're likely to make more progress. But that depends upon you and your neighbor taking action. The stories of success, uh, the success stories coming out of of local activism are not published ever in a newspaper. You'll never see uh, maybe a local, local newspaper, but you'll never see any notoriety outside of the local area, but our friend uh, uh, Dan Titus that works in Southern California as an activist, he's been working to to scuttle uh, the COGS organization down there called SCAG, and he's been fighting against Agenda 21 for a long time. Just recently, <clears throat> the city of a uh, little, well, it's town, it's not a big city, but of Aliso Viejo, I think it's called, it's out by San Bernardino area. They were successful working through the city council to have the the city council actually passed a resolution that forbid Agenda 21 policies in their city. They dumped it 100% by name, and they embarked then on a citywide, top-to-bottom reformation to throw out anything that smacked of Agenda 21. You never heard that story. And it did appear in the local newspaper that Agenda 21 was ousted from that, from that town. If, if other people in other cities saw what could be done in their town, 
they would say, you know, if they can do it down there, we can do it here. Just need to get started. So we need to tell stories like this. You know, we need to get the word out where people have been successful. And you've had some successes too, I know, over time. But where there is success, other people need to know about it because not only does it give them hope, it gives them encouragement that their activities are purposeful and useful. That they've actually done something good. That's right. The only thing incorrect about that is that Lisa Vieja was in Southern Orange County. Mike Munzee, ah, right. um, you know, one of the, I'll call him a freedom advocate, um, the, the city councilman who led that, um, that's one guy, he led that movement to Elisa Viejo and made that change. And the whole town now supports it. The whole town now understands the dynamic. And we need that to happen in many, many, many more American towns. Yeah. So it can happen. It's it not can possible. Happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can happen. Yes. Let's talk for a minute about freedomadvocates.org. Over the period of years, you have contributed. Uh, you had hundreds of articles and, and tapes and interviews. And, oh, my gosh, I know there's a lot of stuff there. It's still up on the Internet. It's still available for people to go there. If, if people wanted to, to do any deep research on what we're talking about today, what, what would they find if they went to freedomadvocates.org? We um, broke things into categories, and I think it's still set up that way. If, if someone's in a rural area and they want to understand what's happening from um, that perspective, there's a, a portion called the Wildlands Project, and people can learn about Agenda 21 that way. There's a the smart growth uh, section. There's a water section. There's a fire section. We have we tried to show how Agenda 21 was expressed through different areas, and all of those articles should be there. Um, and well, we were battered in 2000, in the middle of the last decade. Uh, our, our site was rather destroyed, so we had to recreate it. it took us created it. It's lost a couple of its links. But um, in a few of its articles, but substantially it was resurrected, and, and it's a good place for study and review today. And I would use the search, searching a topic, because um, that the, the website is so rich and so voluminous that the search button will help get you to where you need to go. We have frequently asked questions that are pretty good. There's a lot there. This is, this is kind of like the way back machine of, uh, of the freedom movement, right? right? We figured it was timeless. It's yeah. just the names have changed, but the principles are, remain. The same. We do maintain another site that's much smaller in size, but it's called Globalization of California. And I've made several references to COGS, Councils of Government. And uh, th this takes on the ABAG, the, the Bay Area's Council of and its plans to really reduce city and county government to nothingness as unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats take over all land use decisions for 101 cities in the Bay Area under the cog. And uh, once, it, once it's moved forward a little more in the, in the Bay Area, you'll see it happen in Los Angeles, you'll see it happen in San Diego. That's why we call it globalization of California. But then it's to spread out across the country. You have a cog in your community, you don't know about it, but it's there, and it's making all these plans in the background to do exactly what ABAG has done. We sued ABAG in about a five-year litigation process several months ago. The California Appellate Court, after sitting on this for multiple years, not doing a thing, ruled in an unpublished decision the case has been mooted because ABAG changed their form. Well, all ABAG did is it it does it coordinated with the MTC for the receipt of $300 billion to implement the program. Well, that didn't change what they're trying to do. It just, you know, stopped our action. <laughs> California courts shut it down. So ABAG is now full steam ahead. It will be coming to your state. And by looking at globalization of California, you can begin to understand some of the rudiments of what the COG system is all about. For those listeners who are not familiar with COGS or councils of governments, which I realize many people are not, you can go to the national uh, website for the COGS organizations throughout the country. It's called NARC.org, NARC. <laughs> that has nothing to do with drugs at all, but that's what it is, NARC.org. And you will find a map there that shows every state interactively with all of the various councils of governments that have been already established 
as well as the so-called metropolitan MPOs, metro. I can't get to get it out of my mouth. Anyway, you'll find everything you need to know there to find out what's in your area. And so if you live, uh, even if you live in a rural area, that doesn't mean that you're not subject to a COGS organization. There are these organizations uh, across the country are patently unconstitutional and they're not necessarily illegal in kind of in a twisted sense in modern law, but they are unconstitutional and they promote regional governance and they take away sovereignty from your local city and from your local city council. So if you're curious about COGS, go to NARC.org and look up your state and your city, and you'll find out if you're covered by one of these organizations. Then you can look them up on the website. They all have individual websites. You can find out who the leaders are. You can find out who's by, you know who's involved with it. And if you want to go do some study on, on them and find out what things they're doing that you want to reverse, it's pretty easy to discover. But you have to open your eyes first. Just go look at it. It's all out there. Well, listen, I think we've had a good hit at this. We're... Uh, well over our normal time limit of 30 minutes for a podcast, but that's okay. Uh, this has been good, and I hope we have an opportunity to do something like this again because there's lots of details we left on the table. I realize that. But I want to thank both of you for spending time with our listeners to to kind of share some of your early experiences and stuff. And, and I'll say again to the listeners that the, uh, the discussion we've been having here is with uh, two of the several pioneers of the freedom movement today across our country. These were the early adopters. These were the early champions who did it against all odds and against all other logic, I might add, to say, we're standing up and we're, we just don't think this is right and we're gonna stand up no matter what anybody says. And they stood up, they've made a difference. They're here today talking with us. And as a result of their efforts over the years, there have been multiplied hundreds of people around our country who have become local activists, literally. To, uh, to turn their own communities back right side up. I don't say upside down. They've already been turned upside down. They're turning them right side up again, and we need to have more about it. So thank you to both of you for all the work that you've done over the years and the fact that you're still doing things today and for taking time to share with our audience. I hope they find it uh, useful and not entertaining, but useful from a historical point of view that, hey, if they can do it, we can do it too. Absolutely. Do it. Stand up. Stand up for what's right. Thank you very much, Pat. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. This is Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. Hope you enjoy today's broadcast. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.